All right, I think um, let's make a start. So uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'll assume that you can. Um, a very warm welcome to our... Uh, ah, wonderful. Carlo, you're there. Fantastic. Carlo Grosso, it's great to have you with us. Fantastic. Um, uh, you just miss me saying a very warm welcome to all our donors, friends, supporters, to this latest in our series of Opera Rara online events that we've been running since uh, roughly last June. Um, you're all very welcome. Some of you are uh, old and very loyal supporters to whom we're extremely grateful and others are new. You are all equally welcome. It's a pleasure to have you uh, with us. Um, so uh, tonight is a, a particularly special uh, event for us because it gives us the opportunity to feature Carlo Rizzi, our marvellous new artistic director. As many of you know, Carlo joined Operara as artistic director in uh, June of 2019. And for various reasons, uh, all of which entirely beyond Operara and the rest of the opera sector worldwide's control, he hasn't yet been able to uh, conduct anything, although that's a situation that we fully intend to rectify in the summer of next year. More about that a little bit later. Um, but Carlo has been uh, wonderful in the uh, lockdown months of this uh, terribly challenging pandemic because he's been in an incredibly active presence um, from leading the commemorations for our 50th anniversary, uh, including baking a, a cake online, um, whilst also uh, singing happy birthday to the tune of the overture of the Barbara Seville, which is quite an achievement and I recommend watching it uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, he's also conducted a series of talks um, with a particular singer uh, representing a decade of Operara's 50-year history. And uh, the upcoming one of those will be with um, the marvellous soprano Nelly Mirachoyu, who's enjoyed considerable success with Operara, and that's going to go out on the 5th of November. Um, but now, uh, turning from his culinary skills as a patissier to the core reason for his skillful employment with Opera Rara, Carlo is going to talk uh, to you about the art of conducting. Before I hand over to Carlo, just a couple of uh, things to tell you. The first is that um, we're going to uh, record uh, the talk tonight. This is purely for internal use and one or two supporters who uh, weren't able to be with us have asked if we can record it so that they can see it. We hope that that is acceptable to you all. Um, please can I ask you to remain on uh, mute um, during uh, Carlo's talk, which will last somewhere between half an hour to 40 minutes after which there will be the opportunity for uh, some brief questions to Carlo. Now, you can either put those into the uh, chat, which is the function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and uh, we'll collate them and make sure that um, they come through, or you can wait until uh, the question and answer session itself, and you can just raise your hand either physically or virtually using the raising your hand icon, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, entirely up to you. Um, and uh, so you can ask your questions um, that way. I think I have um, covered uh, everything. So uh, without further ado, Carlo, it's a huge pleasure to have you with us and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, hi, good evening. I will start again because I was muted. This is a first, a conductor that is muted, doesn't speak, never happened before. <laughs> anyway, I was saying good evening, <laughs> nice to be here. Uh, I know many of you, uh, some of you, I don't know, but I hope to uh, get to meet you soon personally. Um, 
I would love would love to have all you here in my uh, living room in uh, in Umbria to speak uh, really very cozily about uh, uh, what we really love that is opera, particularly unknown opera. Now, uh, tonight uh, I say what is, uh, uh, you know, the art of conducting. But there are, this would uh, require about uh, 200 years to try to explain what conducting is. But I would like just to speak about a couple of topics that I think could be of interest of uh, everybody in, uh, in the room tonight. First, uh, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the difference between conducting a symphonic repertoire and operatic repertoire. And then some technical problem about uh, um, conducting opera. And then some, uh, let's call it psychological and emotional problem <laughs> about conducting opera. So the first uh, thing is, uh, uh, what is the difference between conducting symphonic repertoire and operatic repertoire? Well, uh, Obviously, the, the first one is that uh, when you conduct opera, um, there is a stage and there are singers. But the difference is much more deep th than that. Um, first, I would like to uh, say one thing. Uh, when I was starting, uh, unfortunately now 40 years ago, there was a sort of uh, uh, little unspoken uh, um, feeling that uh, it was easier to conduct opera than conduct symphonic repertoire. And actually nothing could be uh, more wrong because uh, you see, um, when you conduct symphonic uh, repertoire, you have an orchestra in front of you, maybe a chorus, maybe some singers, but everything is there. When you conduct the opera, unfortunately everything is not there. And this very hugely from uh, theater to theater uh, you have the orchestra in the pit, you have the stage, you have the, uh, the, the chorus uh, everywhere, you have the production. So what I always say is that the variable uh, of conducting opera are much greater than uh, conducting symphonic repertoire. That means also that the danger are much greater and that means also that uh, the uh, compromising is much greater. Now, compromising is always a very bad, bad word, but actually in any situation where is more than one person, people compromise. It happens uh, in a family, it happens in a group of people crossing the road, uh, you know, otherwise they would go once against the other. It happens in an orchestra, it happens uh, in an in a, in a opera house. Uh, as long as we know that uh, this is necessary, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. But apart from this uh, difference that obviously they are pretty clear, there is another difference. And uh, this is that uh, when you conduct symphonic repertoire, the main uh, aim of the composer is the orchestra, the voices of the orchestra, the different instruments, the different sounds, the different groups. When you conduct uh, opera, this is only one of uh, the aspects and, uh, and particularly, obviously, uh, opera could not be opera without the singers. Uh, so obviously singers uh, are of uh, utmost importance uh, during an opera. And uh, that means uh, that uh, the composer thought uh, not only about orchestra and singer, but about orchestra and singer together, orchestra, singer and chorus together. So one of the first thing that the conductor, I believe, has to do when conducting opera is uh, to see the whole of uh, what is happening. And this doesn't happen all the time. It seems quite simple, but it doesn't happen all the time. Because there are many conductors that uh, uh, actually treat uh, an opera performance uh, like a symphony. And uh, um, you know, everybody's free to do what they want, but actually I think it's wrong because uh, it's not that the conductor conducts the orchestra and the other, you know, do whatever they want or just follow, merely follow. This is wrong. This is absolutely the wrong uh, way of approaching an opera. I believe that uh, the role of the conductor is uh, 
very much uh, the role of a mediator in uh, conducting opera because uh, there are so many, as I'm saying, factors uh, that unless uh, the conductors take this role, uh, things will never gel together. And I'm not talking only only uh, from a um, from a practical point of view, from a technical point of view. This is true. I mean, conducting opera technically is very, very complicated. But I'm also talking about that something that makes a conductor that uh, uh, exceed the technicality of what he's doing, but is uh, really trying to bring everybody together and to, to show the line of the interpretation where the phrase goes. Now, just think about this. If you are on a concert platform, uh, this is, uh, I'm not saying that is easy, but at least uh, the, uh, the space where this happen is, uh, is more clear and the people can hear each other. Uh, I mean, some hold better than some others, but definitely they are all there. Now, I don't know if anybody of you had the, the luck of the misfortune to be in an orchestra pit uh, during a performance. Sometimes it is honestly like to be on the back uh, of a 747, of a Boeing 747. You don't understand anything of what is going on. And uh, you have only in front of you one note to play where it's written forte. How can you gauge this forte? Uh, if you don't hear what is going on. How can you get this forte? You cannot hear what the chorus is singing on stage or the singer is singing on stage. This is why I say that the conductor has to be a mediator. The conductor has to, conducting opera requires much more alertness in a way than uh, conduct symphonic repertoire. In symphonic repertoire, let's be honest, if you conduct Mozart, if you conduct Beethoven, even if you conduct Brahms or Schumann, the technical presence of the conductor is not always required. Um, there are certain points, of course, where it's required. And of course, I mean, we are not going to talk about, you know, Schoenberg, the light of spring. Yeah, they cannot do it without conductor. Although with some conductor, actually the orchestra is better. They doesn't look at the conductor and they just look at the part so that they will actually arrive to the end together. But this is, a, is an aside. But when you are with the orchestra in the pit and the chorus on stage, you need a central figure that tells you, that shows you, not tells, that shows you what to do and how to do it. And here starts the problem because uh, opera as it is done today is not uh, opera as it was done uh, uh, you know, for example, the time of Verdi or the time of, uh, you know, Rossini. Today um, is, uh, is much more difficult because, uh, uh, for example, one very simple thing, uh, with the productions today, the, uh, um, the regisseurs, uh, uh, the directors tend to use all the stage, quite rightly, I'm not saying that this is wrong. But this creates some problems because you see, for example, a very, very, very simple thing. Uh, the sound, sounds travel at a certain speed. The speed is near the 30 meters per second. Now, just imagine somebody, you know, the stages uh, are rather big. I don't know if you have the stage of the mat, uh, you know, it's more than 20 meters this way. Just imagine the course at the back of the stage that cannot see the conductor because it's impossible. So I have to rely on monitors. Now, monitors in this beautiful uh, you know, time that we have uh, with everything is electronic and digital. Unfortunately, the monitors are late. Digital monitors are late. There is a delay. In fact, more than once it happens to me that uh, while I'm conducting, and there are the monitors for the, you know, for the for the people on the stage. The some orchestra members say, please, it is possible to move the monitor because we see you, and then we see you in the monitor, and it's not synchronized. 
So what happened? The monitor obviously is behind the, the conductor, no? Otherwise it would be a little bit of a miracle. <laughs> so if you add the delay of the monitor to the delay of the sound of the chorus at the bottom of the stage to come back, this creates, uh, in not always, thank God, but uh, you know, more than some time, the, the, what creates that you hear two different sounds. And this is a disaster, obviously. Now, how do you try to correct this? Well, um, there are uh, not a lot of way to correct it. The, uh, some, the conductor can do something and sometimes it's the orchestra that helps because sometimes the conductor anticipate with the beat. You know, the orchestra is like a machine that goes. Uh, and so what happened is that the conductor conduct the stage. And in this case, brings forward uh, this delay that it is. Some other time, what happens is the orchestra plays behind the beat of the conductor. And this is why a lot of orchestras are actually playing late on the beat uh, uh, respected uh, of what a symphonic orchestra do, do. It's not because they are lazy, it's because sometimes it's a necessity, because they know that the stage is always a little bit behind, uh, and so they adjust. This, uh, as I explain it, like this seems very, very simple, but actually it is not. Also because if the conductor is not extra clear, what happened is that uh, the, the, there is a moment uh, that is absolutely panic for uh, every conductor. That is when you know that the orchestra is going this way and you start to feel that the stage is going this way. Now, until when we are like this, it's possible to correct it. If it becomes like this, uh, you can just only pray because uh, yeah, it's going to be a disaster. And this is not so much the fault of, it's not the fault of anybody in particular. It just does happen. I would like to tell you uh, an example of something that, you know, the most difficult thing that I've done in my life, technically, has been actually in Bregenz. Now, in Bregenz, uh, I don't know if you know the setup, but the chorus, sorry, the stage is on the lake. The audience is on the shore. Between the audience and the stage, there is some water. Now, on the stage, there are the singers, and there is what is called the acting chorus. Where is the conductor and where is the orchestra? Well, the orchestra and the conductor are in a building nearby, in a beautiful room and are connected to the singers only through audio and um, the audio and, and video. And the singers, they see the conductor only through a monitor that is on some towers. Also, all the public can see the conductor. Uh, and of course, everything is mic'd, is amplified. Now, I conducted there AIDA. And in Aida, as you know, there is also the famous uh, uh, Triumphal March with uh, an offstage band. And uh, there is also uh, the big chorus. Now the band was in another room and the chorus was in a third room, all connected together. I'm telling you, it was uh, honestly like flying a plane uh, with uh, your eyes closed. It was uh, terrifying. But at the same time, it was very exciting because uh, I, I like this uh, technical challenges. And uh, I learned you know, how to do it. And what you'd need to do is to be incredibly, incredibly clear. But there is one big problem that even the most clear person in the world cannot solve in this situation. And this is the lack of feeling with the singers. You can see the singers, but you don't feel what they are doing. And this is why I asked when I was conducting this, thank God, you know, I knew it from memory, so I didn't need to look at the score. I really asked to have a very close up camera 
with the singers that were singing at the time, because the only way that I could see to be really helping the singers and understanding what was going to happen was just looking at their mouth, looking at their chest when the intake of breath was happening. Now, this is something that in a theater is normal. In that situation uh, was uh, uh, really very, very difficult to achieve. So you see, uh, these uh, things uh, are really something that you don't have when you conduct uh, symphonic music because uh, everything, everything is there. But um, so, you know, uh, conducting opera is, uh, well, sometimes I always use the famous uh, uh, Traviata phrase, croce e delizia, you know, cross uh, but delight. Depends uh, in which point of the rehearsal you are, depends how it's going, depends with whom you are uh, working. And uh, working, uh, of course, uh, in this case means uh, singers. Because without singers, uh, as I said, there cannot be opera. Now, what is the relationship between uh, the conductor and the singers? You know, I would like uh, first to say one thing. Uh, there is one phrase that uh, uh, is used, uh, and this uh, um, uh, is a singer's conductor, like a conductor that uh, uh, sort of listens to the singers. And uh, it's not always used uh, in a positive uh, way. Now, I pride myself of being a singer's conductor because uh, if you conduct opera, you have to do opera with the singers, not against the singers. That doesn't mean for a second uh, that you have to do everything that the singers want. But, you know, for example, there are many famous uh, Italian maestros, like for example, uh, Serafin, De Sabata, Gui, that really made their career uh, being uh, conductors uh, that were working with the singers, even at the piano, you know, working, learning the part together. And this is what makes them very great. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, a conductor that uh, do symphonic repertoire cannot conduct opera. I mean, I do symphonic repertoire, but in the moment that you have a singer, you need uh, to think uh, also of the singer. And uh, the singer have one main need, apart from all the egos, that is another story again. And this, the need that they have is to breathe. It seems very simple, but actually, this is absolutely the important thing. I don't know, uh, obviously we cannot go uh, on Twitter back a few years, uh, but I do remember reading, uh, um, um, some singers saying, uh, please, 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 conductor, breathe with us. This doesn't mean that the conductor, again, has to do what they say, but, uh, you know, uh, singers are human beings. You have to exhale and you have to inhale. There is no way around this. And the amount of air that you need to sing uh, is much, much, much bigger than even playing a basso tuba. So, you know, the time that you need to give uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is necessary. And this uh, comes the other technical problem uh, that there is not uh, when you conduct a symphonic repertoire. Because you see, when you conduct symphonic repertoire, um, obviously you breathe with the music. It's not that you yes, conduct but, like, yeah. like a machine, like a metronome. Okay. But uh, when you conduct, uh, with singers, as I say, the need of breathing uh, sometime uh, and very often actually may, may um, sort of uh, get into the way of the phrase. So at this point, what happens? Uh, you cannot just arrive there at that point, uh, put the break down, uh, let the singer breathe and start again. This would be, you know, like, like a, sort of collision, the, it breaks, the, it breaks the, the line, the phrase, the music. So what I believe that the conductor has to do in this case uh, is to be clever and shape the phrase uh, 
in the way that will allow the singer to breathe. And this uh, is difficult. This is very difficult because this requires technique. And, uh, um, well, let's say that there are some that are more gifted than others. Let's put it in this way. I would like uh, now to show you one example of this. Uh, and this is the, um, the moment in Rigoletto, in the duet between Rigoletto and Gilda, the famous, uh, well, sort of an aria that is sing, Veglia o Donna, questo fiore, that of course now I don't find, but uh, there it is. So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, the, the aria, I, I think that many of you know it, no? Is a Veglia o Donna, questo fiore, che a te etc etc now if you listen to old recordings uh, this uh, generally goes like this veglia donna questo fiore che a te puro confidai veglia te with a big rest uh, at that point because it's necessary but it's very slow. Now, interesting, uh, as you can notice, uh, Verdi writes uh, allegro, moderato, sai, but allegro. So the idea of Verdi was not a third class funeral, you know, bam, 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 bam. But the problem is that if you do it quicker, then you need to have the skill to allow the singer to breathe. And this is why sometimes this is done very slow because actually the conductor cannot have this elasticity. Because you see, this uh, has to be like a lullaby. Is, is telling, you know, to the, to the what is the, the child mind there, you know, look after my daughter, you know, is, a, is really like a, like a lullaby. So if you do pam, 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 but if you do and this is the moment when you can allow the singer to breathe without ruining the phrase so it's not putting down the foot and say okay we stop here now and we breathe is a flow that you have to have and uh, i mean operas are full uh, are full of this but this is one of the moment uh, where uh, um actually uh, sorry to sort of uh, you know play the trumpet for myself uh, but this is always one of the moments when the baritone comes to me and say thank you so much because this is the most difficult point of the opera if it's too slow the baritone dies if it's too quick, the baritone gets into hyperventilation and cannot breathe. So it needs to be with this, uh, um, with this elasticity, also because, quite honestly, it's beautiful and is what Verdi, what, what Verdi wrote. So um, now, what is this being a singer's conductor? Yes, I think this is. Does this mean that the conductor does what uh, the singer wants? No, absolutely not. The conductor has to be uh, at the same time following, anticipating, and guiding. Now you will ask, how is this possible? Well, this is the core thing of conducting conducting opera. Now let's take uh, another another little uh, example. Let's take uh, an aria, uh, you know, Norma, that everybody everybody knows, uh, you know, the Casta Diva. You, you need to know one thing. Norma is one of these opera that when is in the repertoire, the orchestra start to uh, try to uh, get away, to get uh, ill, to stay at home, not to play it. 
not because it's not a good opera, but because it may be incredibly boring. I mean, you know, what happened, particularly for the second violin and the viola, you know, 75% of the opera is... Uh, Imagine to have page after page of this, uh, you um, are thinking about suicide. And in fact, there is always one particular point uh, that is uh, in the final trio. So at the end of the opera, where the second violins have two pages of this, uh, then there is one bar of rest, uh, they turn the page and there are another two pages of this. And at this point, always you hear in the second violin session, oh, you know, some people wanting to, to disappear. But again, it's important the way that the conductor does this, because you see, if the conductor just follows the singers, everything grinds to a halt. Just imagine this, uh, ti, ta, ti, ta, ta. you know, singers, uh, um, I mean, I love singers, not all of them, but uh, generally, by and large, uh, I love them. Um, but they think uh, to their voice and quite rightly, you know, is their instrument. Uh, and when they sing, uh, it's all their body that works. It's not just the, the larynx all the body. So, you know, they have a rhythm that is dictated by many, many, many things. And, you know, one thing that you have no idea how many times I have heard the singer asking me is, please, if I slow down, push me. Because they know that for them, for many of them, is normal a little bit, you know, to slow down, you know, to take the time. But if this happened bar after bar after bar, then at a certain point we start reversing. So what the conductor has to do, the conductor has to push a little bit, has to guide, and at the same time has to allow the freedom. Going back to Norma, um, you see, uh, one thing that always has been very interesting for me is to know that, uh, I mean, Norma, what was in uh, 1831, you know, that Bellini and Chopin, uh, you know, they knew each other. And Chopin really valued uh, Bellini as a, as a composer. Well, why? I don't think uh, it's so strange because, uh, you know, if we think uh, of, for example, Nocturne of Chopin, uh, you know, At this point here, I slow down because if I would have done in tempo, this would have been, a, uh, see, it would have been like putting two fingers uh, in an electric socket. Uh, you need the time. Now, when you have a piano, right hand and left hand, uh, you do it. Uh, no? You can slow down here. You can go. Can do all this is simple for a pianist. The fact is that this is what should happen also in Norma. And uh, just try to do this uh, with 60 people in the orchestra. This is the real problem. This is the difficulty. And uh, because you see, it's not uh, like you, you know, in, uh, in music, uh, we have uh, um, the value dynamic sign, the speed sign, accelerando, getting faster, uh, rallentando, getting slower. It's not a general feeling that we are talking here. We are talking little moment, little nuances. It's like little breaths that, you, that you're taking. It's like, you know, caressing somebody, you don't do, boom, you don't do the, I, I hope at least. You know, you start slow, go fast, and then go back. And this is the, the same thing that the conductor had to do and show to the orchestra. 
It's not possible to write. It is not possible to write on the third note of the triplet uh, slightly less, uh, on the second note of the next triplet uh, go, and then on the third triplet again, the first note is uh, with a line. It's impossible. It has to be something that the conductor shows through the beats and through the, um, the phrasing that is also does together with the singer. So the conductor, again, is not just following, but the conductor is guiding and sometimes even anticipating, you know, because uh, there are moments uh, where the conductor really need uh, just to go. It's like a, a jump, um, I don't know, how can we say it? like a blind jump, uh, if you understand what I mean. Uh, you know, like if you just jump and without knowing what is going to happen. Conducting opera very often is this, because if you wait for the singer to express, uh, then it's too late. Because, you know, the orchestra has a, a time of response uh, and you need to factor that in. So if the conductor only follows, uh, you know, it, it doesn't go. The conductor sometimes had to there and to just go. And some, sometimes it happened that uh, it goes wrong because uh, maybe the singer does something unexpected. Now, this happened generally, generally, not so much during the arias, uh, but definitely during the recitativo. Now, what are the recitativi? The recitativi are uh, the parts uh, generally before the arias uh, that are recitate, so, you know, like reciting, uh, this is the idea. Um, and, uh, uh, well, uh, just a brief historical excursus, recitativi started as what is called recitativo secco, uh, only with uh, the harpsichord uh, or the piano, no? Uh, for example, I don't know, Barbaro Sevilla. Si, si, la vincerò, potessi almeno portarti questa lettera. And what the recitativo was, what the, um, the piano was doing, was marking just the change of the chords, of the harmonies, you know? Then it changes here, then it changes. Etc. So it was a, a technical uh, escamotage, let's say, to know where uh, the phrase was going harmonically. And when you have the recitative with the piano, very, uh, with the with the piano or the clavicembalo, in Mozart, for example, very often, you have just uh, the chord. But then there are the recitative with the orchestra, because then the recitativo evolved, developed, and became more uh, um, dramatic, not dramatic as in uh, terrible, but the, uh, using the drama of the words, uh, and the orchestra was, uh, uh, was helping with, with this. Now, I would like just to go a second to, eccolo qua, the recitativo before the aria of uh, Violetta uh, at the end of the first act. Uh, you know, the aria... There is the recitativo before. So what is this, this, this scene? Uh, there's been the party, all the friends, uh, you know, it's morning, all the friends... Uh, and they go. And she remains alone. So all finish. Bam, 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 bam. Now everybody knows this, no? È strano, è strano, in core scolpiti a quegli accenti. Now this chord is there because uh, from A flat major we go to this E major. So this chord has uh, a value a technical value that is to mark the change of the key. But at this point uh, is not just that, uh, is also used very dramatically. 
in fact, it's not like if you would be with the piano, no? Uh, è strano, è strano, in core scolpiti quegli accenti. No, these are strings. Why? Because she is saying, I have uh, in, my, in my heart, uh, I sculpted that words of Alfredo. So this, this action of bang going down, you know, with the chisel, this is, this is why it's like that. And then follows. Completely different world. Why? Because she's thinking. She's thinking to the next phrase. Would be by chance uh, be a terrible thing for me, a real love? You know, she's a courtesan and she feels for Alfredo. So after this phrase, then again, there is not only a chord to change the key, but there is a very atmospheric, I would say, you know, that creates, an, an, sorry, atmosphere in English is a negative, uh, create a sensation, a feeling, an emotion, you know. This is the heartbeat. Um, so, what has the conductor to do? Now, first, uh, has to go together with the singer, in this case, because the singer is free. So, when, when Violetta says, in core scolpiti quegli accenti, you need to land uh, on the word accenti. Now, there are some singers uh, for which it's very easy, it's very easy to understand, because remember, that in the recitativo, obviously, what you need to do is to follow the line of the words. So if you follow, in chorus scolpitio quegli accenti, good. Unfortunately, there are some singers that don't know this, uh, and uh, particularly singers uh, that don't speak the language. Uh, so maybe they do in chorus scolpitio quegli accenti, and what the conductor does is lost. So. Sometimes the conductor to, uh, um, to cover this has to anticipate a little bit. The other problem with the recitative is that if you wait until when the singer finishes the phrase, there will be always gaps between the words and the orchestra. For example, Saria per me sventura un serio amore, a bit, ta 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 ta. But there is a big gap. So what the conductor has to do is on the last penultimate actually note to just already give that bit to the orchestra. But if at that point the singers that decide to go slower, uh, the conductor has already started. This is why what I meant, you know, about anticipating and being like a jump in the dark sometime. And this happened very, very much. Uh, for example, um, just two pages after the uh, two pages uh, after this, when she say "gioire di voluta nei vol," this chord is always a nightmare because if you wait for Violetta to breathe, "di voluta nei," boom, you are late. So you have to trust your feeling of how the singer will take the breath to land on the chord on the right moment. 95% of the time works, 5% of the time doesn't. And, uh, you know, many people say that is the fault of the conductor and sometimes it is, uh, sometimes it's the fault of the singer because they don't know how to show it to the conductor. So, these, for example, are technical things uh, that, but they're not only technical, they go also to impact uh, on what uh, is uh, the dramaticity of, uh, of, the, of the opera. Because if you start to create gaps and gaps and gaps, uh, then the recitativo, the recitativo dies. So, um, sorry. <clears throat> 
so you know from the beginning uh, what what i was saying about technically conducting uh, uh, the orchestra than the singers uh, and now let's just go to talk about uh, another uh, aspect of being a con opera conductor production now this uh, you know when i said croce delizia very often this is a croce it's not necessarily a delizia and this is because uh, um, well, look, listen, I, uh, I'm not very tender with, uh, uh, uh directors because, uh, some of them are fantastic. Some of them, they know what they're talking about. Some of them are a disaster. Um, you know, I always, always, uh, uh have a very, very eerie feeling when I see the director coming into the rehearsal room with the booklet of the CD, just following the words without the score, because uh, I'm sorry, Paul, it's not about that. It's about the words put in music. If there would not be music, that libretto would go into the rubbish. So, you know, just respect the music and try to know the music. Now, some directors know the music, some directors have a feeling for the music, even if they don't don't read music. Some directors don't give a damn about the music. And this is where the problem starts. Because, uh, you know, uh, you know, when I was talking about the difficulty of, uh, of technically having to, um, you know, to manage together the stage, uh, the, 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 the chorus, etc. If you have uh, um, if you have the chorus at the back of the stage, first, it's technically difficult. Secondly, the sound is compromised because it's not clear. It's, you know, the back of the stage, very often there are opening on the side of the stage and the sound goes into that direction. And so uh, it's, uh, it's very hard sometimes, particularly when the director comes with uh, and this is a word that I hate, uh, comes with a concept. And everything has to fit the concept. Traviata dies, uh, actually doesn't fit my concept. Uh, so she will not die in the fourth act. You know, I'm a little bit joking, but unfortunately not necessarily joking. Sometimes it, uh, it does happen. And uh, I mean, there are some funny stories about this, but there are also some very annoying stories uh, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, once happened to me, uh, for example, I was conducting L'Italiano in Algeria. Now in the Italian in Algeria, at the beginning of the finale of the first act, there is a nice introduction music for the chorus to come in. <laughs> Etcetera, etcetera. So, in the rehearsal, with the piano, no, I'm conducting this, and they arrive at the end of the introduction, and they see that there is only half of the chorus on stage. So, I just look at the director, and they said, and they said, oh yeah, yeah, we do a repetition here. Sorry, I said, yeah, yeah, we do a repetition because the chorus is not, uh, there's no space, there's no time for the chorus to come on stage. And they say, well, they can come quicker, you know, this uh, is the music. Oh, no, 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 it's all very choreographed, it has to be like this. And I said, look, the chorus is coming on one row, just make them come on two rows and it's solved. No, 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 it has to be on one row. And what is the problem? We can make a repetition. I say, no, it is a problem because actually Rossini have not written this. So uh, he said, I am not changing it. Fine, I say, you know what is going to happen? I played my introduction. The chorus come in as you want. At the end of the introduction, I stop. I wait for the other half of the chorus comes on stage. And then we start again. It will look very stupid because your production obviously will look wrong, but fine, you decide. 
well, obviously, the chorus came into two lines, as I uh, as I suggested. But you know, this is not uh, is not just to to say I won. It's just to, to say how terrible and frankly stupid it is that I have to say things like this. Uh, when the music uh, is is what it is, the music has been written uh, in, in in this way, and uh, you know th th there is another one that happened to me. You know, Cavalleria Rusticana. There is the the at the end there is the killing of Turiddu. So they go out. The, there is the eerie music, you know, with the chord of the trombone. <laughs> And at a certain point, uh, you hear the famous scream, Hanno ammazzato compare Turiddu! Big gong, boom! Hanno ammazzato compare Turiddu! And then all the chorus scream, a, And then the, you know, there is the play out of the orchestra. It's an incredibly dramatic moment. Okay, in this production, we arrive uh, to that moment. By the way, to read the, rather than be dead off stage, was dead on stage. No problem, but, but that can happen. But then I am there, you know, holding the holding this chord. I am waiting for the scream. And uh, I'm not saying stories, it's true. The stage manager comes from the side of the stage, look at the guy, looks at the guy dead, turns to the audience and says, he's dead. At which point, I think that they heard me for about a 50 mile radius. And uh, yeah, guess what? Again, the scream has been reinstated. So, you know, I, I laugh now because, uh, because, I mean, if you don't laugh, you cry. Uh, but why this is happening? It's happening because uh, sometimes the directors don't understand what the drama is in the music, not in the words. In the word is easy, it is in the music. Now, having said that, uh, I need to say that uh, sometimes, uh, very often actually, I feel very, very um, sorry for the directors because uh, my job is uh, easier than their job. I have the score. Everything is written in there. I'm not talking about stage direction, but everything you know, musically, dramatically, is written in there. A piano, a chord, is enough to follow that. The director, particularly in these days where a lot of the time, a lot more comes through the eyes than through the ears, they have a much harder job, much harder job, because they need to do something new, they need to do something innovative, and sometimes they find a good thing, sometimes they find a terrible thing. So, you know, I have to say, yeah, the job is not, uh, is not, is not, is not easy. But, you know, until now, very often, you know, until now, I spoke about the part, uh, you know, the famous Croce Delizia. I, I talk about the cross, about the, the difficulty. I just would like to spend two minutes to talk about the delight of conducting opera. The delight of conducting opera, it happens when uh, after you know the rehearsals, uh, until when the group really works together, then everything uh, goes in the same direction. And this is, uh, can happen only because of the conductor. And I don't say this to beef myself up, uh, to big, sorry, not to beef, to big myself up, but it's true. It's also true that when it does not happen, very often it's because of the conductor. So, you know, is a <clears throat> two-edged sword. But when this happens, uh, is uh, is fantastic. I have some memories of some performances uh, 
when everybody, and when I mean everybody, I mean, you know, 200 people, we are aiming for the same moment, for the same piano, for the same breath, breath together. It's like if we are part of a family all together, even if I'm in the pit and the, the, the double bass is down under the hung of the stage and the chorus is 50 meters apart. And this is what when really, um, you know, when these things happen, all the rest uh, is uh, is forget is forgotten. And uh, I just finish here because uh, I have bored you enough with this. But there is one thing that I would like to say, and this is uh, this is the in the Vapensiero in the in the chorus uh, in the in the chorus of Vapensiero. Um, you know. Very often, uh, this chorus uh, you hear again the same thing. <laughs> but if you are able to do what Verdi wants, uh, that is actually very difficult because this uh, is uh, um, orchestrated uh, with. Uh, um, oboe and trumpet uh, and the chorus and it's really difficult to get it very piano you know this uh, is not a marcha this is not a pa, 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 pa. not a valzer is uh, um is just the thought the 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 mind of the hebrew slaves that goes around they say the words uh, you know go my thought my memory on the golden wings, uh, go and uh, get uh, back to the mountain, uh, to the uh, to the hills uh, of uh, of uh, of Israel is a positive thing, even if the is the is the chorus of the slave. Uh, so the beginning. Uh, is a positive thing. But then there is the moment uh, when uh, the, the memory goes back, not only to the beauty of the place, uh, but goes back to the fact uh, that the temple has been destroyed, uh, that the towers of the city has been collapsed. Uh, when, when, when they say, And then at this point, uh, there is a, from the pianissimo, there is a huge crescendo. And this is like a scream of all the, the people of, of, of the slave of Israel. Now, one of the main uh, um, memory that I have uh, is really working on this and working on this with the orchestra and the chorus. Uh, and in this bar obtain uh, like a tsunami of sound. There was the sound not only of Verdi, but of the population of, uh, of people being slave wanted just a scream. And you know, this is one of the moments when these things happen. It's not just technical, but it is because everybody believes in the same way. And when you add to the sound of the orchestra, uh, the sound of the instrument, you can add the sound of the voice, then there is no really no better feeling. So in this moment is when the Croce Delizia of conducting opera become the Delizia. Thank you. Have to watch. Well, Carlo, thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you for ending on that wonderful note and, uh, and sharing with us those incredible moments which we all remember when uh, so many people combined together with one single aim to produce these incredible sounds under the under the amazing leadership of conductors like you. Fabulous. Um, we have time for uh, some questions now. Um, is there anyone who uh, would would like to start? Just just raise your hand and uh, don't forget to unmute yourself and um, and go ahead. Who'd like to begin? Roger. Yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> ask Carlo. I thought that was great, Ashley. I, I loved what you had to say about Vapensiero. 
Um, it always seems to me the problem is the tuba there. I mean, with, you know, this magical atmosphere that you're getting, you know, isn't it? But if you have a chimbasso, ah. you know, you get that pure sound. The tuba is always the problem in the orchestration of Apensiero. But you, you're right. And this uh, is uh, actually, uh, I mean, this is a technical thing, you know. A tuba, Verdi never write for the tuba. You know, there are three trombones, and then there is either the trombone or basso, or the cembasso. Now, um, the fact is uh, that uh, very often, uh, because the orchestras uh, are a sort of standards in the people that they employ, they have uh, three people that play the trombone and one that plays the tuba. And uh, this is a problem because the tuba is a completely wrong sound. Obviously, I cannot uh, express, uh, uh, I cannot show to you, but the cembasso is much more uh, lean sound and direct sound and what Roger was saying you know is the by the bass boom, boom, boom. to us seems very boring but actually this is the engine of everything so if you have a tuba that it's like if we put a water a, a hand in some gel but if you have the chimbasso um, um, automatically the phrase uh, goes. And you're so right, Roger. And it's interesting how um, uh, very often, you know, uh, I go, this actually doesn't happen, I have to say, in the UK and, and not in Italy. It happens a lot in Germany uh, where they think that Italian repertoire is easy. Uh, then, uh, you know, they have the guy that plays the, the tuba I said, oh, do you want the chimbasso? Oh, 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 oh. And then they come out with some terrible instruments. It sounds like a fart, sorry. You know, and, uh, and then what do you do? And the same thing is actually, you know, with Puccini very often uh, use uh, 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 four trombones, three trombones and then the trombone basso. Uh, now the person to play the, the tuba and the chimbasso cannot play the trombone. So they have to hire another person. Now this is completely different. Uh, uh, problem, but uh, the sound uh, of Puccini is with for trombones. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not with the with the basso tuba. So yeah, that is a uh, is true. Great, David. Uh, David from uh, yeah, you you had a question. Please tell me. Uh, yes, I've noticed that um, several conductors in when conducting opera conduct up, and other people don't conduct up. Some use bat batons, and some use their hands. What's your attitude towards conducting up versus uh, and hands and things well, like that? There are two, <laughs> two things of this uh, question, so two parts. First, uh, the conducting up. Now, we have uh, a say that is that uh, the are conductors uh, that have the score in the head uh, and conductors that have the head in the score because they <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, um, is obviously, look, uh, the orchestra has the, the, the music in front of them, you know, chorus, uh, singers, they don't. So you need to, to, to be visible all around. If you're yeah. just conducting down, uh, what happened with the stage? Goodbye? No, it's important. So I am a sort of up conductor, if you want. Yeah. And the other thing is about the baton. Now, this, uh, uh, I personally conduct always with the baton and the uh, opera. And this, uh, the reason is this one. It's very technical, but it's very simple. If you move, uh, you know, this, uh, the, the, your finger so much, like, I don't know, what is seven centimeter, 10 centimeter, okay? You do this here. If you have a baton here at the end of the baton become much bigger, that means that the people at the end of the stage see you better. Yeah. This is a is a uh, is a is a simple thing. Now I know that there are some conductors that don't use it and it's fine, but then they have to move the hands uh, much more. And given the fact that I'm not the most athletic person in the world, uh, I prefer to use the baton. It's easier. Thank you. When I said conducting up, I meant some conductors 
hit the downbeat of up. Ah, that. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, that that is a very very interesting question because, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> How long yeah, you're right. In that case, I'm a down conductor. I'm not an up conductor. Right. It's, uh, it's it's wrong because uh, you see, you know why some conductors don't conduct up because uh, they don't trust their own down beat. Because what I was saying about uh, you know flying uh, uh, in the dark. Yeah. You know, if you do this, and you expect something here. This will never happen. Right. But if you don't give the downbeat, as in say, and this is the downbeat, uh, and right. you do this, uh, and then you go up, uh, because then you know that the sound comes there, yeah. you miss the downbeat. Yeah. So it becomes all this, uh, and I don't like it. It is not clear. This is the downbeat, even if the orchestra, if, if the orchestra plays when the conductor is here. Thank you for this question. It's actually very, very interesting. You know, when I was younger, uh, I realized that I was an up conductor. And I hated it. When I saw myself, uh, honestly, I wanted to destroy the camera. <laughs> and then I realized that uh, is a, a question of trusting yourself. Yeah. But to trust yourself, uh, you know, is not always easy. You need to say, you're going to play here and even if it doesn't happen, because technically it's not possible that happen all the time, you show it. But if you do this and then you give in, yeah. no. Right. There we are. Yes. Thank you very much. There you go. Wonderful. Any other, any other questions? Um, I have one. Charles. J J Carlo, uh, talking about downbeats and the problems of sound timing and so on um one of the problems that we've had in operara especially when we've been doing uh, recordings is the fact that a lot of singers simply can't get the down beat i don't know why it is but there's one particular italian conductor friend of yours called maurizio oh maurizio that, yes who says i ask him why is why is it that this particular singer is always late. And we have to do 15 different takes because this singer is late. And the singer does not understand that they're late. It's not their fault. Maurizio said to me, e un tenore. That's okay, fine, fine. But in opera rara, because as, as Tim, Tim has pointed out, at least we don't have directors to work with. And when we're recording, we have takes that we can do. Uh, Tim Lloyd had pointed that out. Um, but how is it that you can, I think it's because of the difference between the sound, but when a, a singer is consistently late on your downbeat, what can you do about it? Well, generally, my, um, my opinion is that you have to shoot them. And <laughs> singer is, uh, because that is something that uh, they don't get, actually. Is, uh, is honestly, is like people that don't get to how to calculate the square root of a number. Is, uh, is, uh, is as simple as that. And uh, I know that they don't do it uh, because they're particularly nasty. It's just because they don't get it. And uh, they don't get it because uh, they, I think that is because they are not uh, sure of uh, of themselves, uh, of putting the voice forward when this happened. They need to hear the orchestra and sort, be sort of be carried by, by them. Of course, there are also singers that are constitutionally, constitutionally late. Uh, that, uh, you know, happens. Uh, some people have a good voice, some people have a bad voice, some people have a good um, sense of rhythm, some people don't. Uh, another very, very small story, but just to say, so um, I was working, uh, I will not say where, of course, with uh, some some singers, and there was one where there was, uh, we were in two, four, so there was one bar, so one, two, one other bar, 
of the same note held, so one, two. And then in the third bar, there was one, and then the dot, and then another note at the end of the bar. And I passed in front of his uh, stand, uh, and my eyes just goes there, and on the top of this long note, uh, there is written five and a bit. <laughs> I said, okay, great. So, you know, this guy was counting uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, and then a bit, a bit, <laughs> a, bit a bit, you know? So, well, you know, possibly that singer was late. <laughs> Great. Any other questions or uh, Charles, shall I hand over to you to, uh, to wind things up? Look, Carlo, it's been great fun um, uh, that you have on this call um, some of the core friends and core supporters of Operara who uh, very recently in some cases have committed very substantial support to the company and I think um, listening to the passion with which you present the explanation of your art, uh, I think that the planning that you, Roger and Henry and the artistic team will be doing will be in good hands and the end result will be extremely exciting. Uh, we, could, we could talk about what it's like to conduct in a recording studio versus a stage. We could talk about all kinds of things. How do you keep singers and, and orchestras motivated through 50 takes because there's a late tenor, um, all these things. But the, the dedication that you show to your art and the passion that you show for your art means that as far as I'm concerned, the right donors have got the right company and the right company has got the right artistic director. And uh, so we look forward to your future talks and we look forward to the product of the endeavors of the artistic team now that we can plan thanks to the people on this call now we can plan for another couple of years uh, yeah. and you. we will be back in touch with everybody Carl, That's over to you. Really important. and i really hope that the next time that we will talk about music uh, can be you know we can be in the same room maybe this one is a beautiful place this one and uh, in front of maybe of a glass of wine or whatever you want uh, because uh, this is what uh, I, I feel that opera is, uh, you know, this sort of uh, enlarged family. Uh, but if there is not this feeling of really going everybody toward the same aim, not only musically, but uh, also as a, as a company, as a, as a you know, institution. Uh, you know, we artists need you. You need us, of course, uh, but uh, is a two-way to a uh, direction, thank you. Amen. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.